in Compton, I didn't believe that we can police our way into a safer city. In all my years in studying policy, planning, and development, I've never seen it. And so in Compton, I didn't have the opportunity or the resources to have that, that option to invest in more police. And so for me, I knew I had to look at the causal factors, which were who are the people that are committing the crimes? And then narrowing down their gang members. Well, who are these gang members? And, and, and really, what, what, are, what is their social fabric? Because the nation still has not dealt with appropriately the war on drugs, the drug epidemic, and really how that decimated a generation of, of, of communities everywhere. Um, Mayor Brown, thank you so much for speaking with us. One thing that struck me when I was reading up on, on your work was that you, took a you had a college class, you learned about redlining and segregation, and that turned you on to politics and wanting to address some of those, the root causes of the inequities, the racial wealth gap we see today. Um, talk about how that's informed and framed um, the policy that you seek to enact as, as in your second term now as mayor of Compton. Absolutely. Um, I was definitely inspired by just learning about our city's hist our, our country's history, um, about some of the inequalities that were really embedded into our country's policies and codes. And for me, um, I, was, I was motivated, I was inspired, I was angry, but I knew that in the same manner that we could actually systematically oppress a specific segment of people based on their color of their skin or their economic group that we also can empower people in the same way using the same tools and so that's really what um, pushed me to, to study policy and to go into public service and as a planner and developer we created programs and, and all of the initiatives and the policy so I, I worked on the ground level and I really understood what it takes to make communities thrive and really what people need in order to grow and I approached that same um, that same service level and with the mindset that I can transform my community as a mayor um, and pushing from the top down instead of the bottom up because I've been a community activist. I understand how um, it's really difficult sometimes to affect um, change and to reach City Hall. And so I really wanted to um, approach my service um, being accessible to my community and understanding that I serve the residents, um, that the mayor's office belongs to them and that I, I'm here to be able to make them thrive and to, and to live. And so um, you can do that with policy and you can be very strategic and, and deliberate on what you do if, if there's a will to do that from that policymaker. And so that's really what motivated me to come into public service. And talk about what specific policy um, you, you based your, your platform on because not only did you become the youngest mayor at 31 years old, I believe, you, you just won a you won re-election. So now you're in your second term. Um, absolutely, I, I was elected with a plan, a 12-point plan, but it was focused on um, really empowering my community, looking at all the pillars of society, and and I went to my constituents and I asked them, what do you need to succeed? What are the issues that you see? And they gave me their their top list of problems. And so, being a practitioner and a policy person, I created some solutions and strategies to be able to affect change. And I came into office on day one with that 12-point plan, and I knew that it would take at least two terms to implement. But we've been able to be really um, successful with affecting change in some of those key core areas, and I. I really focused on the issues that I knew would take the longest time to address and that really required the greatest resources and also the greatest buy-in. And um, when I think about crime, when I think about um, economic empowerment, when I think about education, those are things that really can determine um, someone's outcomes. And I believe that regardless of where you live, how much money you earn, uh, what zip code uh, that you subscribe to, that you deserve a, a quality education, you deserve an opportunity to succeed, you deserve an opportunity to raise your family in a safe community. and so. Those are really what some of the, the tenets and the core principles of our 12-point strategy is. And so we started talking about, started off by talking about how policy was created as a tool of racial oppression and how, how it created the wealth gap. So we're like we're generations down the road now, and so you're dealing with the legacy of those policies that really haven't been fully remedied, um, as um, as many argue they they should be. So talk about what that what remedying remedying those those. those the legacy of, of redlining and of the racial wealth gap look like today and what kind of what kind of concrete things you're doing to uh, help help address that and help uh, build like a, a better future and build build hope for people that for generations have you know many would argue have had good reason to, to not have hope well I think at the local level we really focus on creating economic empowerment opportunities for my residents and removing obstacles for their personal success. So be it if we're doing expungement workshops and job training for our reentry population or our ex-gang population or whether or not we're providing um, specialized housing programs that retain our seniors in the community and also provide home ownership opportunities for single moms or people within the community and also making sure that people have the, the information that they need to make informed decisions because the, the key word in, in policy or planning is gentrification but gentrification just doesn't happen to cities. They they have to be 
number one, facilitated by by uh, outside force and, and an inside force, but then also the people in that community, they have a choice to make, whether or not they'll sell their homes, whether or not they'll stay and be a part of the upper mobility. And so I teach my, my residents, you know, don't sell that intergenerational home that you maybe have inherited from your grandparent or your parent and really retain that and understand that regardless of what happens, we're not making any additional land. And so the value of real estate will be the, the key cornerstone in creating wealth for generations. And so just letting people understand that you know there were there was a time 50 60 years ago where african americans can purchase homes in certain areas and so we are in a position to where we have an opportunity to reverse um some some of a, a small portion of some of the the impacts that that those redlining and, and different codes have had um on our our uh, on our communities of color and so um i know violence is something that affects compton it's sort of in the the music and the 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 culture that's come out of compton uh, Baltimore is another city that's grappling with a historic homicide rate. Your family was personally impacted by violence itself. Um, and I know today you talked about addressing the root causes of violence, something we've, we've been talking about already. But um, talk about how you're, how you're working to address the root causes. I'm really focusing on, when I think about crime, I think about well, who, who are the, the causal creators of crime. And, and in our community, it's gangs. And so really looking at what are the structure of gangs, what are what did number one what do they need in order to, to not be a part of that activity providing those opportunities providing um, ways and pathways for people to come out of that lifestyle because in my experience in talking with gang members the majority of them I've never actually met someone who said I want to be in a gang and if I had a choice to not be in a gang and to be in a gang that I that I would choose the latter and so it's, it's really about opportunity and, and upper mobility and so if we can create a safe passageway for those people that are within those violent activities to be able to get job training, to be able to get um, wraparound services to address their, their family issues and their social issues and, um, and, and PTSD, which is a, another big thing that we're dealing with in our communities, then if given opportunities, that they'll choose the, they'll choose the opportunity. And so that was really my, my test case, that if we can create jobs, if we can create um, training programs, if we can create the, get the legal services to be able to remove those barriers and teach people life skills and job training, um, will they choose to succeed? And in our experience, they have, and people have been able to um, change their lives. They're working great jobs and they're earning great wages, and they've been able to really change the trajectory of their family and their children's children. And so um, I, I know that poverty is something that can be addressed. Um, it has to be a systematic and intentional way to do that. Um, and then it really takes under, it really takes policymakers that are intent on creating policies that create equity, because it, it's, it's not enough to say that we have um, a, a, a set aside program, but who is that set aside program targeted to, and who's able to access that? And so it, it's really about access as well. And I know you came up; you were fighting against the establishment in your in your in your city in Compton. Um, you're in a blue state, and Compton is a Democratic stronghold, as is most of most of California. Um, but talk about the challenges of pushing for this change within a city run by establishment politics, um, within a city that's. A, dem a one party one party town because a lot of cities in this country have those same issues well I, I am a big sus subscriber I don't believe well first of all in, in Compton because we're all democratic um, the issue in, in our community is not necessarily a Republican versus a Democrat it's really about progress versus oppression and so who are the people in position to either provide opportunities for to progress our city or those that are that have a uh, an economic reason and, and a, um, a stake in keeping our community in the same level. And so the, the old guard, they're still there, um, and they, they've been able to create a, a, a stronghold to be able to, number one, keep people out, not engaged, um, underinformed, and, and continue to make the same poor decisions. And so my, my goal in this next phase of, of my service is really empowering my community with education, civic leadership development, and really giving people the information they need to be not just a, a participant but really to be a stakeholder in our community and it really takes a concerted effort of organizing so as, as mayor I'm still a community organizer and I'm organizing my young people I'm organizing our churches our businesses and so I, I, I work with every single segment of society and to help them to be able to get a, a pathway to, to move forward and to hold us accountable as elected officials and that's really key and people need to be able to understand what, what is the voting record of your mayor or your council persons what issues do they actually support it's one thing to have a campaign speech but when it when the rubber meets the road what decisions are you making on behalf of your constituents? And so there isn't a, a vehicle currently that provides that level of transparency, but that's something that I'm working on right now, and hopefully it'll spread to um, other places throughout the nation. Okay, and uh, last question. Um, obviously, 
in a lot of cities you have to turn to working with corporations and large businesses that maybe traditionally haven't been on the best terms with the, the, the communities that you're working with or necessarily reinvested um, in, in the communities in, in Compton. But um, talk about what you're doing to ensure that. Are you, uh, talk about if you're mandating um, affordable housing for developers or local hiring um, when businesses come in. Do you think that's an important part of setting the agenda and making sure that uh, Compton benefits from the, the prosperity that, that corporations and, and businesses are, are oh, Absolutely, I'm unapologetic um, pro-Compton and so in my first couple of months of being mayor, we passed a local hiring ordinance and a community benefits policy that mandates any new development, any new company that moves into the city of Compton, we have to negotiate a customized benefit agreement which consists of training of local job opportunities, 35% minimum. There's also um, funding to be, create additional job opportunities for the community and then local procurement. We for, for instance, we just opened a new uh, 500,000 square foot UPS facility, and the total community benefits package was about $10 million, but it included local procurement over the next 10-year period. And so it's really about finding ways to include your community in its growth and to make that really a, a, a determining factor of whether or not they're able to be able to partner or to be able to invest within your community. And we're, we have a mandatory set-asides for affordable housing in the city of Compton. We've already exceeded all of our state-mandated set-asides, and we're still um, creating additional housing units for seniors, for um, middle income earners, and then also low income. And all of our um, housing developments are all mixed. And so it's not about creating a, a public housing project, but it's about creating pathways for home ownership and for people to be able to stay within their community that they've lived in for so many years to keep that fabric of the socially intact as well. Okay, well, it's so refreshing to hear these thoughts and these initiatives and being unapologetically willing to take on power and hold accountable. At the same time, offering to hold that have the public hold you accountable as well. That is really fresh, refreshing to hear, and I'm sure our viewers will feel the same way. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate that.